All right, we're going to talk a little bit about human resources today. I'm hoping everybody knows what human resources is or have a fairly good idea about what it is. Um, basically, the whole purpose of human resources management or human resources department is to assist in staffing of organization training, um, human discipline at some time. So they're very critical to, to most organizations or all organizations. So I have an example for you guys. Say we have a large physician practice or a large physician office and they need to hire someone to manage their information management area. The practice was, you know, started out with seven. It's grown now to 23 positions. 23 positions is a pretty large practice um, in the past five years. And the practice administrator realizes um, that the clinical and financial records needs of the practices have basically outpaced where they are right now. So the administrator wants to recruit for this position. So if we're the administrator, what types of things might we consider when we're looking for this information management person? The newest technology that's out with QuickBooks. Yeah, you know, they have to them. So their te technology mm -hmm. experience. Financial software. All right, what else? Um, have they the worked soft skills. Are you talking about the person that we're trying to Yeah, if we're the administrator and we're looking to hire this person, what types of things might we consider? Their experience. Experience, yeah. Are they able to multitask? It's 23 physicians is a lot. Very good. Multitasking, okay. Education, right? They have more history. Work history, um, you know, and that's important because is that important when you're looking for someone in a new, in a new techno, you know, like like somebody that's just starting out in the healthcare management field, but they have all these classes that are just, you know, are new technology. Well, it's a good question. What do you think? Uh, I well, want to hear I what you think, think first, and then well, I, 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 I have, the, I guess, the Air Force uh, mentality is, you know. We don't take other branches of service because we want to train you the way we want you to be. So a new recruit is better than someone that comes from another service. Okay. I think I that... Maybe I don't know how to put that in terms I think of it depends on the organization. We're talking about a large organization, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in an instance like this, work experience probably is going to be kind of important. We need to know that this person has experience with work, working with large practices. Um, so a, a person fresh out of school or a person that's only worked for a practice with two positions mm -hmm. may not be able to handle this type of environment, right? Yeah. So in but some instances... But on the flip side, they may not know have the technology because they've been in the work field and are not up to date. This is true. This is true. And so that's why I think in some instances it's just going to depend on the environment mm -hmm. and, and on that person. person, right? Because, you know, they may not have worked in a large practice, but maybe they have some other type of experience where they've worked in a busy environment mm -hmm. or something that they may be okay. So without knowing more about the candidate, it'd be kind of hard to say either way. Um, Anything else, or have we covered everything as to what we would consider? Well, I guess you have to consider the person in the position at that moment. What are you going to do with them? <laughs> well, they don't have anybody right now. Oh, they don't have anybody. They're looking for someone to, to lead that area. They have em oh, employees in that area, but they're looking for someone to, to lead, lead that area. area. So as we Basically go through, the new right, as we I go through, Keep this example in mind. We're going to come back to it a few times. Um, so, you know, HR includes some activities that are strategic. For example, um, you want to make sure that you have a good mix of staff, meaning you want to make sure that you have some staff members that are high quality. You don't want to have 
all the new graduates, mm -hmm. you know, you want to have a good mix. Um, and you have to remember that the performance of the organization is going to depend on how each individual performs. So if you have a lot of employees that are lazy or not um, good producers, then your organization is going to reflect that. HR is also administrative. There are a few different administrative functions that um, the Human Resources Department carries out to make sure that the organization is performing at a high level. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. Again, uh, we have to remember that employees are basically the drivers of the performance. What that means is without employees, there's no performance, there's really no organization. So the employees are the ones that are providing, in most cases in healthcare organizations, the patient care services. And so we are pretty dependent on these employees, right? So what all this means is we have to be very um, specific and strategic about who we're hiring and who we're bringing into the organization. Um, speaking in terms of healthcare specifically, it's a very complex industry. You can't necessarily hire, even if you're doing the same task in a healthcare environment that you would do in a different environment, you may not necessarily be able to hire the same type of employee. Um, what that means is the type of employee you hire as a bank teller may not be the same type of employee you hire as a registration um, person, even if their tasks are fairly similar. Because again, healthcare is very complex. So it takes a special type of individual to be able to provide healthcare services, even if you're not working directly with a patient or doing clinical, um, it still takes a special type of person to just work in healthcare, period, which is why all you guys should feel good about being where you are right now. Um, so what are some environmental factors that might affect the human resources department, right? Well, obviously, declining reimbursement, healthcare reimbursement, it affects everything, not just one area in the hospital, you know, it affects human resources as well because declining reimbursements means the organization as a whole is making less money, which means the HR department is going to have less funds coming into them, which means they'll have less resources to spend on recruiting, hiring, training. So it affects everything. Um, low supply of workers, right? Well, you might say, well, you know, Unemployment is in high. There's lots of people looking for work. Doesn't mean that they're the type that we need, right? Again, healthcare, we need special people, special types of people that have special skills. Um, increasing population needs. People are sicker, living longer, so the needs are increasing. Increasing competition. We see that right here in Fayetteville with everybody building and um, so competition's going up. And just external pressure um, for accountability and performance. Now that information is so transparent and people can see everything, it's more pressure for us as managers and for healthcare organizations to do, make sure they're doing a good job. So I want to talk a little bit more about the environmental forces. We've already talked about what, what fewer resources does. But when we talk about a shortage of um, workers, what does that mean? The workforce will fall on. Exactly. That means that in the meantime, until we get those people that we need, the people who are already working at, within hours. your hospital, longer hours, more stress, possibly you know more dissatisfaction, lower employee morale. So that comes back on who? managers, right? Mm -hmm. To create that workplace environment where people want to come in to work and you're not having high turnover. And absentees. And absentees, yeah. right. People don't want to come to work or to come in late or mm -hmm. you know, leaving early. All those things. Um, so over the years there have been different types of laws and legislation that affect HR. I'm not going to go through all these because, as you can see, it's a pretty exhaustive list. And you see here at the bottom, 
where we will also see how the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act will also affect HR as well. So HR domains. Here are the two main um, categories. We have workforce planning and recruitment. So that deals with figuring out how many staff we need in each area and how do we recruit these people. And then you have retention, where the people we already have working, how do we keep them and support them and nurture them and all that kind of stuff. So with the workforce planning and recruitment um, component, it's a lot of things that go into to this uh, area. Uh, the first one is job analysis. What do you think that might entail? It's pretty much what it, what it sounds like. It, it involves looking at the job, figuring out exactly what tasks are done within the job, um, what types of skills may be needed for the job, what, what types of education. All those things go into the job analysis. Um, and this is important because you can't hire somebody if you don't know what they're going to be doing. If you can't clearly state that to them, then you can't move along down to recruitment. So job analysis is very important. Then we have workforce planning. This deals with staffing and, you know, do we need two employees in this area or three? Um, establishing job descriptions. Now, the job analysis will be closely evaluated when you're establishing the job descriptions because you want to make sure that things from the job analysis are included in the job description. So when you go to post that job, you've already included all the skills and, and education that you need. And then, once you have the job description, then you can start recruiting. Then you can start you know, with your postings and your flyers and you know, social media or whatever um, ways you decide to recruit, um, whether it be, even if you recruit in-house, that's what I do. Most most medical facilities start in house, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It just depends on what the job is, um, <coughs> or if it's a brand new one, they can't. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. Harnett County, it's brand new, so they have to. Um, so it kind of just depends. But uh, even if you're hiring from in house, all these things should still be evaluated. Um, can anybody think of why that might be the case? Consider if you are replacing someone or the position is not a new position and you, you want to hire from within, well, things may have changed between the 10 years that that person has been there. So you may need to reevaluate their job analysis and redo and update the job description. So regardless of if you're recruiting from um, inside or outside, all of these things should still be done before you get here. So after recruiting, you have the interview process where you're interviewing candidates. Um, ultimately, you will select, you'll have a selection process where you select the candidate. And then, in some cases, you'll have negotiation and some you won't, and then hiring. And then the final step is orientation, right? So these all fall under workforce planning and recruitment. So then, you know, I, I mentioned that the other uh, component was employee retention. And these are the components that fall under, under that category. Employee relations and engagement. Again, you have to make sure that you're constantly making sure that employees are engaged and, and happy and satisfied. And some of that will come with the training and development. If they're constantly feeling important and involved and privileged enough to have training and development, that will help. Compensation and benefits. You can't, you know, expect people to come in on time every day and, and, and not feel like they're properly compensated for their work. The last thing you want is for someone to feel overworked and underpaid, right? So compensation and benefits also falls under this. Employee assistance program. Does anybody know what this is? It deals with our question this week, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not quite. Who has the books? 
school, <coughs> you know, like to further their education? Or no? Don't they have any growth problems? Any, well, they do, that is part of under there, right? If they have any kind of um, problems that they need right. to discuss, confidential or. Right. You're on the right track? Yeah, you're on the right track. Um, and this is important because it gives employees an outlet. Mm -hmm. And they don't, if they don't want to necessarily talk to their manager or a supervisor, they have this program to turn to. And depending on the organization, the program can be very broad and cover a lot of things. Um, or, you know, I've even seen some programs that help with legal issues. Yep. So it really just depends on you know the company and how much money they put into the program as to how broad the program is and what it covers. Um, assessing performance. Typically, most organizations will have reviews that are done annually, sometimes more frequent, frequently than annually. And this also comes under HR, employee retention. Um, labor relations. Some organizations will have unions. Um, some don't. Sometimes you'll see nursing unions and things of that nature, and that also falls under employee retention. Uh, leadership development. If you have someone that you're trying to um, develop, move them up in the company, or, or involve them in any succession planning, um, that also occurs as well. And then employee suggestion program. Always good to have an employee suggestion program, because a lot of times employees have good ideas. They're working in you know this organization day in and day out mm -hmm. so they can easily see how things can be improved or how things can be changed to make things run more efficiently so what are you know you, you might be thinking about working in hr and you know that could be something that you all choose to do once you're done <laughs> that's what i had as my major a week before i started school and things you all work in hr i, have, yeah. I can see you in hr also you can't see me in healthcare management. I'm sorry. HR, <laughs> HR within healthcare management. management. We're talk, this is a healthcare uh, management course. So, uh, um, no, we're talking about that. HR <laughs> in healthcare management. No, I don't see. Whatever. <laughs> so, what are some of the responsibilities um, in recruitment? Well, we talked about preparing a job description. That's one responsibility. Job pricing. Deals with making sure that the salary that you're offering is within the market and competitive. Preparing the advertisements and recruitment materials. Keeping track of all the applicants. Hopefully they'll have some type of database or system. You have to check references. And you maintain personnel files, which uh, we all know are confidential. And narrowing down the candidate pool. Some jobs you'll have lots and lots of people apply for, which are typically those entry-level positions. Well, it can get to be a burden if you have a whole lot of people applying. And so it's important that you kind of narrow down the candidate pool. And different organizations have um, various ways of doing that. I've seen now that organizations are starting to use like a resume scanner. And it's some type of program, and basically when people submit their resumes, they kind of scan it electronically for keywords. And then if you don't have any of those keywords on the resume, your resume kind of gets especially on post oh. foreground. So it's important that you have a really good resume um, put together so that you can kind of not get eliminated through. What kind of keywords? It's gonna depend on the job. The job. So why is it, uh, is it just protocol that they uh, <clears throat> have all these people to apply for a job knowing the whole time that they're going to give it to somebody with them or they already yeah. have some, yeah. that's just um, protocol? Yeah, because you have to uh, say that you were diligent about advertising for the position and that it was uh, done fairly. Okay. Yeah, which it really wasn't. <laughs> yeah. If you're talking about like I'm four grand? I mean, anywhere, uh, not just to your yeah, brand, anywhere. Yeah, I was going to say, because they, they have a, a tier, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. power service gets first. So oh, yeah. yeah. And things like that, which is sometimes not fair because. Yes. I mean, just in general, because they always say it's, who, it's not what you know, who you know. Yep. So, right. So, um, 
We talked about the responsibilities of staff. So here's some of the responsibilities of manager in the recruitment process. Um, you'll want to make sure that the job description has been done correctly, that everything's been clarified. More than likely, you'll be the one interviewing candidates. You'll also be ranking the candidates, meaning, you know, Jane Doe was a 10, John Doe was an 8. Um, you'll obviously be selecting the candidate. And then a lot of people sometimes think that the actual manager that you are working for deals with the numbers and negotiating, but a lot of times it actually is the human resources people that handles the salary negotiations, things of that nature. Money, right? Compensation. Um, base pay typically is related to education, whatever skills you have. Um, and then you'll have incentive compensation, and this won't be for all positions, it depends on the position, but they're tied sometimes to organizational performance, sometimes to individual performance. Um, Another way, I guess, of kind of saying like a bonus. Mm -hmm. um, then we have benefits, which in some cases is almost as important as compensation. Um, and benefits have to be, you know, evaluated as well as compensation. We talked about job pricing and making sure that your compensations are within market and, and fair, but you also want to do the same thing with your benefits as well. You don't want your competitor to have this really good benefit package and they're hot, you know, recruiting all these people and you find out that no one wants to come work for you because your benefits aren't good. So benefits are pretty important also. What are some types of benefits? Well, we have sick leave, vacation time. Vacation time is very important, right? Mm -hmm. Holidays. <coughs> health insurance, life insurance, retirement plan, and flexible spending accounts. And there's other types of benefits. The whole list isn't listed here, but these are some of the main ones that most people you know, expect to see in their package when they get hired. I have a question. Yes, ma'am? What is flexible spending account? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, it is, let me see if I can find the best way to explain it. Every year, you get um, at one point in the year, you get an opportunity to pick an amount. And everybody doesn't have flexible spending accounts, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna explain to you what it is. And whatever amount you pick, you can use that amount throughout the year towards certain services. And it's pre-tax, which is why a lot of people like it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll, I'll use me as an example. Um, over the years, I've had a lot of dental work done. So I've always used my flexible spending account for my dental work. Mm -hmm. And basically what happens is, and it's kind of an estimate kind of game, you have to estimate how much money you're gonna spend within a year on whatever services. Mm -hmm. And if you go, once you use all that money, that's it. Um, if you don't use the money, you lose it. So you have to make sure that you spend all the money. Um, but it can be used on like co-pays, child care, child care um, prescriptions. They've got a little strict, stricter about oh, prescriptions, but yeah, prescriptions. It used to cover like vitamins and stuff too, but I don't think it covers um, that over the counter. Yeah, no, no over the counter. Some accounts also cover like therapy, like physical therapy, um, um, psychiatric, um, chiropractic. But it's a good way to lower your, um, because it's pre-tax, it's a good way to lower your um, tax bracket. Your tax year. bracket, correct. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously the more you put into your flexible spending account, it's going to be more advantageous to you because it's going to lower your tax. Not um, right. So for people that have like childcare, mm -hmm. um, and most accounts will have a ceiling, so they may say you can't use more than 2500 um, but for people who people who have childcare love this 
because they're able, and you, you get a card in the mail, so you just kind of swipe it like a regular debit card. And um, if it's uh, an approved service, then it'll come right off your card. So it's a, it's a good thing to have. Um, if you get hired by a company that has this, that's a good thing. It's just a way for you to save money in the long run. Um, so it's just an added benefit. They're saving kids because you get, it's double tax. You get the double credit. Yeah. You get to claim child tax credit, you know, the child care credit, and it's non tax. Right. So, so yeah, so it's a good thing. And, you know, if you want to go into more detail later about it, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. But, but yeah, I've usually used it for like dental the most. So if there's a, an expense that you know you're gonna have like every year that's kind of yeah. pricey, mm -hmm. it's good to just use your flexible spending account for it. I've never had an adoption, but my sister swears by her, her daycare. Yeah. Well now medical, since our kids are. Yeah, so, so it's a good thing to have. Um, performance appraisals. Performance appraisals are basically like your evals that you have. Um, and it helps you to make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, it also can be um, a method of improvement. If you do your performance appraisal and you have a staff member that's not performing at the level they need to, it's kind of like written documentation as to if things get worse, why it might be means for termination. Um, it can also show you where they may, um, if there's certain areas they may be lacking in, that they need training or development. This can be um, justification as to why you can send them to that training or, or um, why they need to be moved to a different department or whatever it may be. Um, it's also a way to, to get more information from the employee about what interests them. Uh, you know, maybe they want to work in radiology and they're tired of working in surgery. Those are the types of things that hopefully you're getting from the performance appraisals. Um, compensation adjustment. If you find that you know two years have gone by and this person has done very well in their performance appraisals, maybe it's time to give them a raise. Or the employee <coughs> may say, well, look, I've had really good reviews these past few years. You know, can we talk about possible raise or promotion? Um, so performance appraisals are very important. And again, um, this is something that's kind of done collaborative between HR and the actual department manager. The appraisals will be kept within HR. They're the people who maintain and keep them. Um, so, you know, this le lecture today was kind of short, but I want to hit on some key things to make sure that you have some take home um, points about today. Um, HR, we talked about it, that it's used for strategic and administrative reasons. We talked about the fact that it's used to um, help line managers in coordinating their staff, recruiting their staff, maintaining their staff. Um, and it's closely tied to organizational performance because if we're not hiring and recruiting staff that can perform, then our organization is not going to do well. Um, and I think that as the job pool keeps changing with you know, unemployment or with more people going back to school or what have you, the HR functions and responsibilities are going to continue to be more important. And not only that, as people are living longer, we're having different types of patients, we're having more patients, so we'll need, again, specialized staff to be able to work with these types of patients and their needs. So um, HR is you know, pretty important, and like I said, if any of you decide that you have an interest in HR within healthcare, mm -hmm. we can talk offline and I'll try to see about um, helping you get like a co-op or something in HR so you can get more experience in the area. So is that like, um, do you like recommend job shadowing? I do, and I actually, one of my students in another course, I've set her up to do some shadowing with somebody in a particular area, just so she can see if that's something she really wants to do and get some exposure to it. I definitely recommend it if you can do it. And that's what I was wondering about the, the thing you have posted online, the, cop, the summer thing. Is that just for scholarships or is that something we could do in a field that maybe we were interested in that we don't know about 
as much about. Your question is, if you just wanted to do it, if for whatever reason you didn't get the scholarship, mm -hmm. but you still wanted to do it, I'd probably have to talk to the contact a little bit more to get specifics on that. I, I can ask for you. Now, when we get ready to do our co-op, you choose the person for us? Like, say we tell you what field we want to go in, and then you tell me? Um, How does that co-op work? Well, 